personal driver for a billionaire for three years, for the guy that owns First Choice Bank for two years. I've been with the same family for eight years. Now I represent, not only represent, but I'm the sales manager for Tall Girl Limousines for two years. Who's been a motivating force in your life, man? If you have looked back and you said, man, you know, this person two really people. motivated. Two people. And then tell me what they did. You can just talk it Everybody us. has some kind of motivation. Everybody has some kind of self-esteem. The level of that is what makes you different. Where, how much, how much you use of that? And for me, nothing motivates me more in this world than my mother and my father. Because being the first generation with a little degree, being the first generation to make over $100,000, being the first generation of a business owner, uh, being the first generation successful businessman, I give all that credit to my mother and my father, which both are still alive, but always remembering where they come from and always taking from where they come from to the limit. The biggest change a mother can do for a son is put him on the right track. At 15 years old, my mother understood that if I didn't get out of Harlem, I was on the wrong track. The streets will take do that to you when you don't have fam a lot of family, a lot of educated family, a lot of family to take you and pull you out. My mother did the best she could. We have so many people that need to go back to the ghettos and help that one kid like me. Come out of it. There it is. That's where my heart goes. Now, it's a shame that we don't have our own real, real you know, people coming out and letting the world know that we are struggling like everybody else, but we are being successful also. We overcome that Exactly. So, I'm proud to be a Puerto Rican today and every day of my life. It's not always about money. A lot of it is about time to, to let these kids see that just because they are where they are doesn't mean they can't go where we are. Another story in the jungle. That's all it is. This is what they call a New York Rican. New York this, Rican. This bro. is what they of getting to the place actually hits you. And as we were coming up, did you see all those people? There were like uh, just massive amount of students down there. So when you see the crowd and how big it's gonna be, and now it's right in front of you, that's when that little part kicks in, that little nervousness. Why am I a little nervous? I don't know. Like I said, it's just a big crowd. Um, I gotta run the speech in my head, so I gotta pull out my uh, throw up bag. Where's my throw up bag? Damn it. Where the hell did I put that throw up bag? All right, so here's what we're gonna talk about tonight. The, the acronym for today is O-M-M-O-T-Z. O, optimism. I'll tell a Martin Seligman story there. M, this is when I'll try to transition and talk a little bit about my mother because everybody wants to hear how I got out of the hood, got my degree and all that good stuff. I joke a lot about my GPA and how bad it was, you know, that whole thing, you heard that earlier. The M right here, um, I never told this story before, but I'm gonna tell this story about when I went to a March of Dimes event and actually uh, donate my time to the Special Olympics and how hard that was. And also it's going to be an uplifting story about how, eh, you'll have to hear the story. Uh, this O right here is a tribute to Octavio Mateo. That was the guy that it was a uh, ship director that I mentioned. 
and he's the guy that really helped me. And I really want to emphasize to students that there's people on campus that can help them if they run into trouble. We lived off of food stamps, government cheese, powdered milk. We were poor, 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 poor. You know you're poor when you change the TV with a what? Pliers. You know you're poor when you use a what for an antenna? Hanger. Thank you for feeling my pain. All right? We were poor, folks. Today I live what is known as a very nice zero debt life, which means I don't know anybody anything, and I live a nice life. Could I ever have imagined this life? Absolutely not. But when I look back at all the different people in my life who came in and out, who helped me, this is why I do what I do. Because I want you to be successful. I want you to go out and make your money. Because I want you to build your own companies. Rise to the top. Do whatever you got to do. And here's the second reason I want you to be successful. Because then I want you to help somebody else build their company and rise to the what? The top. The T is going to be like a transformation mechanism. What's a transformation mechanism? It's when I'm going to take this one item, basically present something that's impossible, and then make it possible. More to come later. And the Z? Always got to end on a cool story. So I'm going to tell a good zip lining story at the end there. So again, um Mats. That's my acronym for today. And my job is to bridge each of these stories together. And at the end, what's not on here, I always end with the logic of success pledge. That goes something like this. I pledge allegiance to my thing. Rise above doing what you love. Make that dough doing what you know. And those who laugh can kiss my assets. Get the idea? So we'll see how it goes tonight. So time to roll it. I'm going to bed. I think the theme, you know, something that hit me, you know, when I was in the room thinking about it, I think the theme is going to be finishing the race. In other words, if you started something, you got to finish it, no matter the obstacles, no matter what comes at you. Uh, so you'll have, you're going to hear me repeat that phrase two or three times. That's going to be, I, I decided to wrap it around that theme, finishing the race. Here's one of the messages I want to send out. Is college going to be tough for you? Absolutely, folks. But can you guarantee me one thing? You got to finish the race. It's a competitive society out there. Today, a bachelor's degree is your basic starting point for getting into corporate America. You gotta finish the race. I don't care what your GPA is, I want you to finish the race. Now, let me be clear. I'm not saying, woohoo, whatever your GPA is, I don't care, and I'm not saying that. <laughs> I want you to get the best GPA you can, but I want you to what? Finish the race. Today, I'll speak for about 45 minutes. 2,500 kids will hear that speech. All 25 will pick their own moments in time in that speech and say, that touched me, that resonated with me. From that point forward, I can't control anything else, but I'm hoping that when they go back to school and they're sitting in their dorm room, laboring over some exam that they have to take the next day, studying hard, they're crying because they can't figure this stuff out, much like I did, that they go, the guy said, finish the race at any cost. you got to finish the race. And he goes, screw it, let's go do it and not quit. I think it's egotistical to think that I can change somebody's life. I think it's egotistical to think I can change somebody else's life. I can. I can only provide a slight push. That's it. You think of any person's success from A to Z. Between A to Z, there were many moments of truths, moments that happened that kept pushing them forward. I am just one simple moment in a, I don't know, from A to Z, in a bunch of little moments along that path. You're part of the, the success process, and you're not the pivotal point. You are just throwing a stone in the water. When I wanted to get out of the neighborhood, it was all about, you know, getting out of the hood, man. Just, you know, no more food stamps, government cheese, powdered milk, that whole bit. Um, you just wanted to get out, you know. So when I graduated, I moved to Minnesota, uh, went to work for Honeywell, it's no secret, great company, and, you know, it was one of those things that, you know, I thought I'd hit the American dream right there, you know, go to school, get the education, get the degree, and get the J-O-P. And so I was happy, like anything else, you're happy for the first year, you're like, making some money, you're not poor anymore. The option was, if I didn't go to college, I had to work in a what? A factory. That option was out. So I said, you know what, I'm going to college. And what do you think was the primary motivating factor for me to go to college? Yell it out. Who said money? Who said money? You think that I would go to college just to get a job for money? You think I'm that shallow? You would be correct. <laughs> and so what happened is the first year goes by, money makes you happy. Second year goes by, the money isn't sustaining that happiness. 
By the third year, I'm not liking my job. What happened in those three years? Corporations happen. You, you know what's wrong with corporations? Here it is in a nutshell. They're run by people. And that's always going to be the problem. Corporations are run by people. And because they're run by people and people are imperfect, you always have an imperfect company. And when emotions get involved, politics get involved, favoritism, I don't care, nepotism, you, any type of ism you want to throw at it, something eventually happens where you go, I don't want to do this anymore. One day, quit, got another job. Um, and that's actually how I started getting into sales. I started doing more what I call removed from engineering, more what I call application work. And then one day in this new company, they need a manager to travel Latin America to do sales and training. That's why I met my mentor, Jose Santana. And this is 1992 when I first got into sales. And that guy right there, that guy right there, Jose Santana, he's from Cuba. This guy was the ultimate salesman in my book. We all come across people in our lives who are just fantastic salespeople. This guy was awesome. I followed him around for almost a year in Latin America. First of all, he had a voice like Ricardo Montalban. He would talk like, Oye, Victor. I mean, he had this beautiful, sultry voice. When customers would see this guy, they would want to hug him. And whatever he was selling, guess what? They were buying. And so I followed him around for about, like I said, for about a year, maybe a little more. And I think everything I learned in sales, as far as relationships, how to deal with people, how to treat people, I learned from that guy right there, Jose Santana. The great thing about being in sales is that there's no hiding. You have a number. You have to hit that number. There's no excuses. Nobody wants to hear them. You had a quota. Did you hit your quota? Bam. A very objective empirical metric. In corporations within the organization, the responsibility is so diluted amongst different responsibilities that if a project doesn't get done, well, marketing didn't give us this on time. If that would have happened, we would have had that on time. Well, maybe if we had coordinated better and really had planned to strategically do you know, all that. I think the first sale you have to make is to sell yourself on the actual product. And if you can't sell yourself, who the hell else is going to believe you? I think what happened was this quiet discontent started to build. And it was one of those things where, I think it was around 37, I'm going to say, could be 38. 37, 38, I started getting that quiet discontent. What do I mean by that? It's one of those, I was about to hit 40. And all the things I thought about doing, said I wanted to do, I hadn't done any of them. My wife says, I've gone ahead and set up a zip lining tour. Now, who knows by a show of hands clap what zip lining is? <laughs> wow. If you don't know what zip lining is, here's a visual. Tree, tree, wire. Zzz. You get the idea? <laughs> all right. Now, I've been married 20 years. Thank you. Four different women add up the years. Who cares? Doesn't matter. <laughs> and so we had a little money in the bank and it was time to roll the dice. You know, if not now, when? So one day, it was May 9th, 2001, 3.48 p.m. when I made the phone call. How do I know the time? Because I called him on my cell phone, called the chairman of the company, says, I'm done. And at that time, this is in the book, you know, my base salary was 250000 I had 110,000 shares of stock. The guy's like, you're gonna what? The next day, I get up, got the shorts on in Miami, got the t-shirt on, baseball cap, got the sandals on. And so I'm walking to McDonald's. I don't have my cell phone with me, which was the weirdest feeling because who was gonna call me? And then something happened, what I call a small Zen moment. I started, I saw a can, and I started kicking the can. And, I, and it was that moment I realized, when was the last time I just walked down the street with no cares in the world and kicked a freaking can? And I can't remember that. If you think back, maybe when I was a kid. At that very moment, I realized I had no worries. Even if it was only for that moment, I was kicking a can down the street and I was perfectly freaking happy. I know that, that will make no sense to whoever hears this, but I really don't give a shit. I'm telling you, it was the greatest moment. I said I was kicking a can, it was kind of casual, and you know, it hits you like, wow, I broke free. And then a new feeling kicks in, pure horror. 
Because now the reality hits you. Like, you know how you get this euphoria? I quit, you bastard. See ya, type of thing. And then, and then, man, what happens is like, oh shit, what did I do? So my wife, after 20 years of marriage, you would think that she knows me well enough. And my wife knows that I'm afraid of heights. Yeah, you see the problem, right? Because she made it sound like it was going to be two small trees, like a you know, little oak tree. She goes, zip, 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 not a big deal, right? But we got to Belize, and guess what? These are over 100 foot trees. And I'm looking up, and I'm seeing these people, like in the canopy, right up there, zip, all the way, you know? And I'm looking at this going, no way am I going up there. And then my little girl, the great one, looks up at me with those beautiful big eyes and says that one word that would melt any father's heart. What is that? No! She goes, sissy. Right? You don't know my girl. I raised her hard. Right? So my girl says, sissy. Now, when your girl calls you a sissy, it's time to man up. If you don't know the organization, basically <clears throat> you get like 10 speeches and each speech is supposed to help you improve on different aspects of speaking. Uh, the first speech I gave was man. It was horrible. Man. It, was, it was pretty pathetic. Uh, I'm glad I don't have that tape. I don't think I could see it again. And so I looked at my first tape I said, man, I suck. The second speech got better, third, fourth, fifth, so forth. I completed all 10. It took me about a year, maybe a little bit over a year, to complete all 10 speeches because you don't do them right after the other. The second year, there was a competition. And what, what, what it was is that everybody in Toastmasters in that little organization could compete to go to what they call the, the area level, the next level, and compete with other Toastmasters organizations. So we held the competition with our, within our little group. And that year, the second year, I had to compete against Hale. And Hale Mesro was one of the most eloquent speakers I'd ever heard. The guy was, <clears throat> he was like a gentleman when he spoke. I mean, it was just like, it was regal. I mean, the man was just regal when he spoke. And I used to look at this guy like, holy shit, look at this guy speak that way. Now, he wasn't like rah, rah. The man was regal. He didn't need to get emotional. He just talked and you just listened and you enjoyed it. I didn't win. I was devastated. I was like, Shh. but again, when you lose to a guy like that, you're not you're not feeling too bad. Fast forward, make a story short. Third year, you know what happened? Kid Vic got it. I actually beat him, and the guy was gracious enough to come over and says, "Man, it was excellent, Victor. Congratulations." And so, as I went back to my working career, I got the bug. You know how you get the bug, but you let it sit there, and I guess the bug was getting bigger. The last company I was with before I really got the bug. <clears throat> Uh, they gave us tickets. Uh, the organization was called Peak Performance, and they gave us these tickets. The company bought tickets, and every month, Peak Performance brought in some of the top speakers. That's when I saw Zig Ziglar for the first time. I was like, holy shit. So I put on the gear, put all kinds of harness on you, right? You get all ready for it. And then what happened, we had to climb up the side of the hill to get to the first platform. Get to the first platform, and there we are. What you do, listen carefully, pay attention. What you do is you got to put the pulley system on the wire, and you got to hold it with your left hand, right? Now, the wire's going that way. They give you a special glove with a piece of rawhide, like leather, right there. They say, that's your braking system. <laughs> Fast forward, if I say from 95, I mean, think about it. I walked away in 2001, so it's like a, something that built over, what, almost six years? By the time it built up and I said, what am I going to do? I said, man, it's too late to open up a nightclub. Definitely don't want to be in a band anymore. Let's go do it. As you're zipping, you're holding down like this, and you let your hand right on top of the wire. And the guy says, now listen carefully. When you get halfway, you're going to start picking up speed. <laughs> you, but you're also going to start seeing the other tree. <laughs> what you need to do is to slow down. And this is how you do it, he says. What you need to do is tap, 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 tap. You know, just g gently tap the brake, right? He says, whatever you do, whatever you do, do not try to stop on the dime. He says, your arm will come out of its socket. <laughs> now, 
You know how people give you too much information? If you're too uptight, you're not going to like my humor. You're not going to like my style of speaking because you're expecting a more, you know, basic speaking. We're ready. It's our turn. There we are on the platform. Visualize it, okay? I let my wife and kids go first because that's what real men do, right? <laughs> I let them go first. Wait, 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 wait. What does society say? Let's go by norms. Women and children, what? That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. People are getting smarter. And today, in a world of high-tech society, we have access to the, the internet. Uh, we can now download videos from other speakers, audio. We, we got all access to this information. The question is, how do you differentiate yourself as a speaker in this market? And if you don't have your own style, you're screwed. It was my turn, and sure enough, I start zipping. Now, I don't know if I jumped off. I can't remember. I really can't. <laughs> he may have pushed me off. It's not a big deal. I don't think we should talk about it. By the way, I do have pictures, but I will not show you the video because there's no point in seeing a grown man scream. It's just wrong, right? On so many levels, it's wrong, right? Look, there's nothing new in the world of motivation as far as new material. The only thing new is how you deliver the content and make it more impactful on the individual, period. I'm zipping, right? And you're like, Zzz, right? And I start zipping and I tell myself, don't look down. You ever notice when you tell your brain, not to do something it does the what exact opposite so i look down and man the floor is a blur my feet are dangling i'm like this is not good and then i see the other tree and i start what <laughs> yeah and sure enough i get to the next platform and you know i kept going i kept making it now let me ask you a question do you think i was scared yes. do you think i was scared yes. but would you also agree that it was probably what exhilarating wasn't it because everything you ever try for the first time is it going to be scary absolutely but is it also going to be what exhilarating absolutely folks it's about oh geez we got about another hour and a half before my check uh, yeah now i'm starting to think about it a little bit going uh, i got to speak to a large group really that starts setting in real quick about now am i nervous not really eh. i i met this uh kid named carlito third grade and you know it was one of these kids that you know you know if, if, if God had come down and said here's the coolest third grade you'll ever meet that was Carlito you know I met him in third grade and it was funny you know we hit it right off the bat you know the teacher had asked me you know who would show Carlito you know around the school I was in third grade you know I was like yeah I'll do it and Carlito always appreciated the fact that I raised my hand you know so I showed him the lunchroom, you know, and everything, and after lunch we went outside, and I thought he was going to need some partners to hang out with, right? He got outside, man, the kids just ran after him, man, the older kids, because his father, I found out later, ran the Little League team, right? So his father ran the Little League team, and so he was popular already, man, third grade kid was like, I mean, you know. Uh, and so as the years went on, you know, it's like his coolness just grew, you know what I mean? I mean, you, got, you had to see him. It, it was like by eighth grade, all the girls wanted to be with him, all the guys wanted to be him, you know. And we went to high school together, and it was really cool, man, because we decided to share lockers in the first year, right? And it's like his coolness carried over, you know what I mean? I mean, I mean the guy would put on clothes, and he just fit right. His hair was feathered perfectly, you know what I mean? The whole bit. And, you know, during that time, I always say that, you know, I met my first true love, right? In, in high school, and it was Angelina Santiago. And, you know, and everybody else goes, oh, that's so sweet. And I go, man, Carlito got her, <laughs> <You know? laughs> and so, which is true. And so by, you know, and then Carlito started getting into things, you know, and by his second year, you know, man, he was selling weed out of, our, out of our locker. And, you know, if you know my mother and you know the chancleta, it was time to separate. Mm -hmm. And so by third year, he had gotten his girlfriend pregnant, a different girl, girlfriend pregnant. And he never made it to the fourth year, just dropped out somewhere between third and fourth year. And I didn't see much of him afterwards. Uh, but I remember uh, after graduation, I remember one summer day, uh, it was close to the time we had just, I just gotten up a job in uh, my first job, you know, the Honeywell job in Minnesota. And I saw him, we were, I went down by Lake Michigan with a couple of friends and I ran into him, you know, and he seemed to be doing okay. You know, you, know, you can never judge, you know. And that was the last time I saw him. And so I moved up to Minnesota and a few years later, I remember uh, out of nowhere, I remember it was, it was like a February morning or something, cold as hell in Minnesota. And my uh, brother called me up, you know, he says, you know, Carlito's dead.
And I remember walking outside. I mean, I still remember the day. I walked outside. It, it was the. Uh, it was cold. It was snowing. You know, it had snowed outside. It was cold. I had a T-shirt on, and I just you know couldn't feel anything. And I remember that. You know, I wasn't sad. It was like I was mad. And I didn't understand why I was mad till you know, sometime afterwards. And this is the reason I was mad. From third grade on, I'd always idolized Carlito. I always wanted to be Carlito. It's like I put him on this pedestal. I always compared myself to Carlito, and I always found myself wanting. You know what I mean? I was never good enough. Uh, and that was the day that I accepted the fact that I will never idolize another person again. Because when we do that, what do we do to ourselves? We undermine ourselves, don't we? You know, I'm too fat, I'm too skinny, I'm too short, I'm too tall. And in the end, it doesn't matter who we are, you know, as far as our weight, height, the whole bit. And so I've learned that from that day on, I will never compare myself to somebody else. And I suggest to you guys, and I always tell this to the audience, stop comparing yourself to other people. Stop trying to be somebody else that you're not. You are who you are. You're perfectly imperfect. Just accept that as being fact. And I think people relate to that because I think everybody in the audience has a Carlito in their life. They go, yeah, I know somebody just like that.